Hey, what's up Seekers? Welcome back. We are doing a series on Maimonides and his relationship to mysticism. We began the series in last week's class by presenting Maimonides, his life, his work, and legacy. In this week's presentation, we're going to be asking just how many Maimonides were there. To answer that question, we're going to try to present a rough sketch of the different pictures that have been drawn throughout the ages about our man Maimonides, and then turn our attention to the question of his relationship with mysticism to see what these scholars have had to say on the subject. Maimonides has been seen as everything from an avowed enemy of Kabbalah to a covert Kabbalist who hid the secrets of Jewish mysticism in his guide, to an infiltrator who polluted Jewish thought with Greek philosophy, to a halachist who in reality despised philosophy, to a thinker forced to choose between Jerusalem and Athens, and one who needed to hide his true conclusions, to a deviant who established Jewish law and thinking according to rabbinic precedents, to the one responsible for establishing rationalism's place in Jewish thought, to an accommodator of Judaism to modern and contemporary life, he was seen as a proto-Kantian by Herman Cohen, as a rationalist for whom reason was supreme according to Achad Ha'am, as an Aristotelian philosopher who didn't see the fundamental incompatibility between Aristotle and Judaism, or one who tried reconciling the two from the outside instead of creatively from within, to one whose philosophical work bore no relationship with his halachic work, to a rabbi and philosopher par excellence whose life work culminated in a creative synthesis between revelation and philosophy. In the past two centuries of Maimonidean scholarship, the question of Maimonides' relationship to mysticism has been raised more than a handful of times. The 19th century Jewish historian, Henrich Greitz, understood the 13th century rise of Kabbalah as a direct reaction to Maimonides' rationalism. Gershon Sholem, the famed historian of Jewish mysticism, did not see Kabbalah's rise as a reaction to the philosophical enlightenment of Maimonides, but saw within Kabbalah, particularly within the Zohar, a conscious response to the great philosopher. Moshe Idel, the prodigious Romanian scholar of Jewish mysticism, disagrees with Sholem, no surprise there, and returns to the earlier position of greats, arguing that Kabbalah did in fact consolidate and get its act together in response to Maimonides. Idel presents a rich historical irony in which Maimonides' rejection of proto-Kabbalistic streams of Jewish mysticism not only failed to suppress and repress the mystical, but was what gave reason for the mystics of Judaism to rise up, unite, and write the great text of Jewish mysticism that would become the canonical form of Kabbalah in the 13th century as we know it today. However, Idel differentiates between Maimonides' impact and reception amongst the theurgical, theosophical Kabbalists, for whom Maimonides was largely a negative catalyst and an antagonist, versus the ecstatic prophetic Kabbalists, for whom the great philosopher was a thinker who supplied key concepts necessary to the self-understanding and self-expression of the mystics, and who often read Maimonides as a straight-out mystic and covert Kabbalist. We'll have more to say about that all in a moment. Elliot Wolfson goes a little further than Edel and sees Maimonides as being a positive catalyst, not only for the prophetic, aesthetic Kabbalists like Abulafia and others, but also for the more classic, theosophical Kabbalists, particularly in the motif of Dvekut that develops in early Kabbalah as a continuation of the themes of prophetic and intellectual worship found in Maimonides. David Newmark, who charted the history of Jewish thought as a continuous cycle of opposing trends, thesis and antithesis, saw Jewish mysticism and Jewish philosophy in constant opposition, and considered Maimonides to be the last representative of the classical period of Jewish philosophy, following which, in Newmark's opinion, the pendulum swam back to mysticism, peaking later in the characters of Cordovero and Luria in Sfat in the 16th century. This position has been echoed by many, including Julius Gutmann, writing about the oppositional relationship between Kabbalah and the rationalistic philosophy of the 13th century in his classic survey of Jewish philosophy. And the Jewish-German philosopher Franz Rosenzweig likewise saw Kabbalah as a reaction to Maimonides' philosophy. Harry Wolfson, the great scholar of Jewish philosophy, who set many trends in the academic study of Maimonides, chose, despite his thorough investigation of Maimonides' thought and its place in the history of ideas, to ignore the aspects of Maimonides' thought that we may consider the spiritual or the religious experiential side, perhaps what may lean into the mystical. 
Shlomo Pines, whose translation of Maimonides' guide into English remains the best in the field until today, continued Wolfson's lead, examining Maimonides strictly as a rationalist, and argued that for Maimonides, human knowledge is fundamentally capped by its own materiality and cannot contemplate the spiritual or the metaphysical, and concludes therefore that Maimonides was no mystic. However, in his later writings, Pine seems to go back on this position and begins to speculate about what he calls Maimonides' intellectualist mysticism. This trend continues on in the French scholar Georges Vajda with his exploration of philosophic mysticism in Jewish thought. Vajda, in the words of his student David Blumenthal, considered Maimonides to be the epitome of the philosopher whose teachings shaded almost imperceptibly into mysticism. Herman Cohen, the Jewish Kantian philosopher, was of the opinion that while several prominent passages in Maimonides' writings reveal his appreciation of the poetic vein in the mystical love of God, nevertheless Maimonides' principal aversion was not only to asceticism, in Cohen's opinion, but also to mysticism. The scholar of Jewish philosophy Alexander Altman, in his classic essay on Maimonides' attitude towards Jewish mysticism, concludes that while Maimonides' system contains some formal elements of mysticism, the question of whether Maimonides should be classified as a mystic will have to be answered emphatically in the negative. Altman's negative estimation of Maimonides' mysticism, even while sympathetic to his potential affinity to forms of Jewish mysticism, is typical of 19th and most of 20th century Jewish Maimonidean scholarship, portraying Jewish rationalistic philosophy in inevitable opposition to Kabbalah and to earlier forms of Jewish mysticism. Jewish mysticism was understood to be synonymous with Kabbalah and in its essence opposed to the rational and intellectual approach that had been advocated by Maimonides and his followers. However, towards the end of the 20th and with the opening of the 21st century, going on eight centuries since Maimonides' passing, the question of Maimonides' relationship to mysticism has been opened up afresh once again. Joseph Fauer, Simon Rewitowitz, Diane Lobel, Joseph Citron, David Fried, and Gideon Frodenthal have all in one way or another argued for the presence of mysticism in Maimonides' thought. Abraham Joshua Heschel believed that Maimonides had been privy to the prophetic experience as he, Maimonides, had explained and understood it. Alfred Ivry has argued for the presence of classic Greek and Muslim mysticism in Maimonides' philosophical sources, most notably those of Neoplatonism and Ismailism, more on that coming up soon. Those arguing that Maimonides should be rightly read as a mystic of sorts object to the earlier scholars and historians of Jewish thought for creating what they feel is a false dichotomy between philosophy and Kabbalah, rationalism and mysticism. From this false dichotomy follows the obvious conclusion that Maimonides was not a mystic because Maimonides was obviously a rationalist and mysticism is obviously the antithesis of rationalism, obviously. The most sustained argument for Maimonides' mysticism has been made by David Blumenthal, who repeatedly over the course of his academic career has stated and restated his arguments for considering Maimonides a mystic. In his estimation, Maimonides had an exoteric teaching of rational intellectualism and an esoteric teaching of post-cognitive piety, and a level of worship, one which could not be achieved without the intellect, but which was after it, which transcended it. We'll discuss some of Blumenthal's arguments and their merits in the course of these upcoming classes. On the other side of things, Sarah Strumsa, Stephen Harvey, and Kenneth Siskin have all argued in one way or another against Maimonides' mysticism. But the most extensive objection to Maimonides' mysticism comes from Menachem Kellner, who in 2006 published a full-length work entitled Maimonides' Confrontation with Mysticism, which argued that Maimonides was not only not a mystic, but was consciously responding, combating, and debating what Kellner calls proto-Kabbalistic mysticism, which was circling around in his day. Kellner attempts to demonstrate how on a host of issues and questions of halakha, Jewish law, the holiness of God, the Jewish people in the land of Israel, ritual purity and impurity, the Hebrew language, God's presence, the distinction between Jew and non-Jew, and the topic of angels, Maimonides offered a philosophy of Judaism, which sought to replace the enchanted, mystical, intrinsic, ontological, essentialist understandings of these categories and distinctions with rational, institutional, sociological, historical, metaphorical, functionalist, normative, nominalist, conventional, and instrumentalist conceptions instead. To put it in simple words, in Kellner's own words, these distinctions I show Maimonides to hold do not reflect the presence or absence of actual properties in the entities under discussion, but rather simply the ways in which the Torah commands the Jew to behave with respect to these entities. And lastly, there are some scholars who sit on the fence of this question, 
Adam Ofterman, for example, traces in very fine detail the themes of union and communion in the writings of Maimonides, but concludes that in the final judgment, we cannot call Maimonides a mystic, because his reading of the love of God that Maimonides speaks of is not a unit of love that ever approaches or unites with the object of love, and that the unit of language that we find in the guide is always restricted in Ofterman's reading to subdivine mediating entities never directed towards God herself and even those sub-divine unions may only be possible after the individual passes away as post-mortem forms of unification. In Joseph Citron's appraisal of the field of modern Maimonidean scholarship, despite the many nuanced works written about Maimonides' philosophy, and trust me, the production of scholarship is never-ending, the general portrayal of Maimonides remains one of a committed Aristotelian who considered an understanding of physics and metaphysics to be the pinnacle of religious knowledge and whose writings bear very little resemblance to mystical thought. In the upcoming classes, we're going to be looking at the scholarship which questions this self-evident status quo to open up the subject for what will hopefully be a fair and balanced reappraisal of Maimonides' relationship with mysticism. It's hard work to suspend our judgment and our preconceived notions. It may seem painfully obvious that Maimonides was a philosopher and therefore not a Kabbalist, or a rationalist and therefore not a mystic. But I'd like to invite you to place those conclusions that we may take to be self-evident to the side even just for a second, and examine together with me the best of the available scholarship on the subject and Maimonides' own words, so that we can question those assumptions and dichotomies in our thinking together, and move us in a way that may bring perhaps to more unity and clarity. And while we may not come to any conclusive definition about whether Maimonides' rationalism was a form of medieval mysticism, we may learn something about both categories in the process, and maybe even something about ourselves. Thank you very much for joining, thank you for watching, thank you to our patrons who support this project and allow us to continue producing this work. If you can afford and would like to support our work, please do consider joining them. Thank you for watching, see you next week, and keep seeking.